ena mana ena reo ena iwi me na hoa fa tena ko te katoa ko hala Nicholson toko ingoa te po koko mataraka te farewananga o taku norera tena ko te tena ko te tena tato katoa. Good evening. My name's Helen Nicholson, and I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic. And on the be behalf of the Vice Chancellor, who sadly can't be with us, um, and the wider university, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this special occasion to celebrate Mick Black's promotion to Professor. And it's great to see so many of Mick's colleagues, students, and friends here tonight. But I'd like to give a special welcome to uh, Mick's Fano his wife Mel, his sons Liam and Kieran, his mum um, Elaine and sister Susie, and Bob and Julianne, his parents-in-law, who've all travelled to Dunedin for this special occasion. It's really lovely that you can join us, so welcome. And a big welcome to, to those of you who are watching online. No mai hari mai. So inaugural professorial lectures are always wonderful opportunities for us to celebrate and learn about the special journeys of our outstanding colleagues as they made their way to become professors. In a minute, Professor Matisu Smith's going to give a formal welcome to um, a formal introduction to Mick. But Mick, I just wanted to personally congratulate you. Um, and for the rest of you, in my previous roles as Dean of the School of Biomedical Sciences and as a member of the board of New Zealand Genomics Limited, I've at times worked quite closely with Mick. Um, NZ NZGL, as some of you will know, was a company that was set up to provide both gene sequencing and bioinformatics, which is making sense of the sequencing data that comes out. Um, and it was set up to provide this service for all researchers across the MOTU. Um, as any setting up of any company, and as we developed the, the company, it wasn't always plain sailing, not least because we were trying to manage um, resources and facilities across three universities. And during that time, um, Mick, your sense of enthusiasm and positivity and the way that you, your willingness just to make things happen, I really appreciate it. So thank you for your um, support and your leadership at that time. So Mick, it's been a pleasure for me to work with you and congratulations on your well-deserved promotion. So now I'll hand over to Elisa. Tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto kato. Tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, my name is Lisa Madison smith and I am the current acting dean of the School of Biomedical Sciences. So, um, as Helen said, I um, have the honor of being able to introduce uh, Mick to you tonight. Most of you, of course, don't require an introduction, but um, I get to give a bit of background um, on Mick. So, um, Mick received his BSc in 1997 from the University of Canterbury and then took off to the great state of Indiana um, to undertake his master's and PhD at Purdue University, receiving his MSc in mathematical statistics in 2000 and um, his PhD in statistics in 2002. And I had to, convince, um, had to confess to Mick tonight, um, I've always had to kind of keep uh, you know, stalking his uh, research outputs and so forth because both my parents are Purdue graduates and my father found out, went to a lecture that, that Mick had given um, where I was also speaking and, and dad heard that Mick was, was a Purdue, Purdue grad. So it was always, you know, how's, that, how's Purdue Mick going? How's Purdue, what's Purdue Mick up to? So, um, I mean, I, I, I have been lucky enough to be able to, to be on uh, PhD committees and things with Mick so um, I could assure dad that the University of Otago was very lucky to have uh, Purdue Mick um, on, on our staff. So um, as you've heard, um, Mick is indeed a, a bioinformatician or a statistician whose research focuses on the development of methods for the analysis of genomic data with a strong emphasis on cancer and other human diseases. 
common theme is the use of techniques that allow high dimensional and often very disparate data sets to be combined in ways that provide new insights into disease development and progression. This research is highly collaborative, and, and I can certainly attest to that, uh, working on projects that, that Mick has been involved with. And he works with a number of Otago research groups, as well as long-standing national and international collaborations, the University of Auckland, the Institute of Environmental Science uh, and Research, Wake Forest University Medical School, and Moffitt Cancer Center. So in addition to his own work, uh, Mick has been heavily involved, as we heard, in establishing national research infrastructure and high-performance computing uh, through the NZ e-science infrastructure uh, and in genomics and bioinformatics through Genomics Aotearoa, where he is the chair of the bioinformatics leadership team. So I work with genomic data. I generate genomic data. I'm in awe of bioinformatists. I was part of the generation that could, like, look at your data by eye and kind of identify relationships, and we're long past that. So, um, you know, indebted to bioinformaticians like, um, like Mick. But um, what makes Mick really, I think, uh, particularly impressive is that not only is he a brilliant statistician, but he's a great person and really easy to work with. Um, and, uh, you know, that. Sadly, not all bioinformaticians are so easy <laughs> to work with. <laughs> you understand the real data and the issues. So anyway, um, Mick uh, is presenting his, his talk tonight, uh, Genomics by the Number, um, Adventures in the Dataverse. So uh, again, a little bit of history. Mick's introduction to genomics came um, just as his PhD. Um, as he began his PhD, when it became apparent that statistical methodology provided an invaluable toolkit for analyzing the vast volumes of biological data being generated by new high-throughput technologies. Fast forward 25 years, uh, and the same statement holds true. So technology continues to advance, the size and complexity of data sets continue to grow, and analysis of high-dimensional data remains a key component of modern genomic research. So the analysis of large-scale genomic data sets has been a central feature in Mick's highly collaborative research career, and this lecture he will take the opportunity to focus on some of those highlights, as well as thank many of the individuals who have helped make the journey both successful and fun. Well, the list of organisms and diseases uh, that Mick's research encompasses is broad. His primary focus remains cancer genomics, and is, he's passionate about using data-informed genomic research to improve outcomes for cancer patients. In addition to his research work, Mick has also been involved in a number of major, as we talked about, uh, national infrastructure initiatives. So um, I'm at this point going to uh, hand over to the person we've all come to hear tonight. And uh, congratulations, Mick, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Kia ora tato, ko whanapaki te manga, ko maitai, te awa, no wakatu, ahau, ko mig black tako inua, tēnā koutou katoa, nā mai, hari mai, and welcome. Wow, oh, thank you. Thank you all for coming. That's good. People came. Um, hello to the online folks. I know there are some people watching online. There may even be some people watching online later. Um, thank you very much, Professor Nicholson, Professor Madison Smith, um, for a lovely introduction. Um, and um, really special to have you guys here. Um, as part of this, um, and Sally and Neil too, um, you guys have been amazing friends and colleagues um, for so many years now. Um, and I'm glad you let the, uh, the NZGL uh, cat out of the bag <laughs> early. We'll get to that part of the story later on. Um, so to start with, let's start with a couple of facts. So first off, I am a statistician. This has been pointed out. And um, what is slightly strange is that I'm a statistician that lives in a biochemistry department, uh, which, that, that, trust me, that is quite strange, not just the, the department. <laughs> We'll get to that later. <laughs> so what I'm going to try and do is, um, through this lecture, explain to you how this has happened and how I've ended up um, starting off on a statistical path but ending up um, in a very different place. So when you're young, there are endless possibilities, right? So you start school, um, and you don't have to pick. There are so many things to choose from. It's a, it's a smorgasbord. Um, considered fisherman was, was an option. Soccer star, doesn't really look like that was ever on the cards. Superhero, would have loved it. It would have been spectacular. 
Long distance running, the, um, the uh, venerated Clifton Terrace uh, Primary School long distance running team uh, was probably never really going to, uh, to go too far. Luckily, however, um, you don't have to figure it out back then. Uh, you've got a lot of time to figure it out, and uh, when I started to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, um, it was actually at Nayland College in Nelson, where I grew up, and some of it actually happened in this room right here, um, which was um, where I had my sixth form statistics class. And um, what happened one sunny afternoon near the start of the year is uh, our, 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 um, our teacher, uh, Mr. John Walker, took us all outside. And what he said was, bring your pens and pencils um, and uh, come out. And there was a tree. I don't think it's that tree. I think they've remodeled the front of the school. I think the tree was actually over here. I could have just told you it was that tree. But <laughs> it was a tree. What we did with the tree is we measured the lengths of leaves on the tree. So uh, we measured hundreds of these things, and we wrote them all down, um, and then we took them back inside. Once Mr. Walker had had enough time in the sun, I uh, took them back inside, and he went to the chalkboard, and in those days it was a chalkboard, right, with chalk, um, and he drew a big long line, and what he asked us to do is he asked us to call out the lengths of the leaves that we'd measured. And we started calling them out, and he would put them on the blackboard kind of in the order that they appeared. And so the short ones would be down one end, the long ones would be at the other end, and all the middle ones would be in the middle. Um, and they kind of built up, and they formed the shape, and the shape that they formed, as you probably know, because I put a picture of it, was the normal distribution. And it was an almost perfect normal distribution from collecting these hundreds of, of um, leaf lengths. And for me, that was amazing. That was the first time I'd seen an example of one of these theoretical distributions being able to represent the data that we'd gone out and collect, collected. What I was also quite intrigued by was that you could create that distribution with a mathematical formula. So you could actually um, use that mathematical formula down the bottom there to draw that, math, that, um, that uh, normal distribution, um, which for a you 16-year-old know, just getting started with a bit of math was pretty exciting. So with that in mind, with that kind of general enthusiasm for statistics, I went off to university, and I did a lot of things at university. Um, one of them was statistics. But by my third year, um, I, was, I was pretty focused on maths and stats, and at that time I encountered these two individuals. So they taught the two stats courses um, that were on um, in, in third year. They were full length, four year courses, so you did an entire year in the same course. Uh, and so Professor John Dealey was the chair of statistics at, um, at Canterbury at the time, and uh, Dr. Frank Ladd was a senior lecturer in the department. Frank was writing a book uh, while I was uh, a student there, and Frank actually used his lectures basically as a, a way to test run the material in his book. Uh, so we did the exercises, found the typos, um, learned all the stuff that he was putting in there, and it was an interesting book um, because it was actually teaching from a, a very different perspective. It was what's called a Bayesian perspective in statistics, uh, which is not the sort of thing you would normally teach to undergraduate students. Um, but Stats at Canterbury at that time was, um, was unusual <laughs> uh, and extremely fun. John characterizes the idea of Bayesian statistics um, with, a, with a great quote. Uh, he says, all uncertainty in a problem can be characterized by a distribution. So just like the, the, normal, distri the, the normal distribution we saw before, um, we can collect data, it will follow a distribution. Um, we can also assign probabilities, and those will follow distributions as well. And we put all those distributions together into a mathematical model, and we can solve that um, and get a better understanding of what our data are telling us. Now, a way to do that, to do the computational work to solve the problem, had been proposed a few years earlier in this landmark paper, um, which defined the, the, what's called the Gibbs sampler. And another unusual thing to be teaching undergraduates at the time, John Dealey was teaching us how the Gibbs sampler worked in the mid-90s, and we were going into the computer lab and programming that uh, in MATLAB uh, and solving these um, very complex statistical problems that actually, before this um, methodology had been developed, really weren't able to be solved. Um, so that was exciting for me, being able to go write some computer code and solve a statistical problem. Now, around that time, and I hope Richard's watching uh, from Christchurch, I'll give him a wave just in case he is. Around that time, um, one of my other lecturers, Murray Smith, um, uh, introduced me to Richard Jones, who had a summer project at Christchurch Hospital uh, looking at uh, what are called electroencephalograms. So when they put electrodes all over a patient's head uh, and they record, back in those days, it was a 16-channel recording, so 16 electrodes on your head, recording uh, the electrical activity from the brain. And what Richard's team had done was develop an automated system, a computer-based system, for reading these EEGs. So here's the, the EEG traces. Now, that's one page. These things came in a big book. So the clinicians would look through pages and pages and pages looking for um, this, uh, this typical um, epileptiform activity, um, which would indicate abnormal brain activity uh, in, the, in the patient. 
What Richard was wanting to do was to compare the performance of the system, so the system could say there's no activity, there's questionable activity, there's definite abnormal activity, against how those expert clinicians um, would do. You can see there already that it's not perfect agreement. If it was perfect agreement, everyone agreed on the diagonal. So sometimes the system would detect something, the experts wouldn't, sometimes the experts would detect something, the system wouldn't. And so what my project became was to, uh, to perform an analysis uh, to see how good that system was doing. And that actually resulted in some of my first publications, uh, conference proceedings, um, a letter, <laughs> which has been cited twice, one of the times I think was by us, um, and then finally um, a, <laughs> a clinical study that was actually evaluating the performance of that system. Um, uh, that also formed the basis for my honours project in my fourth year, um, and at the same time, I found in the medical library at, uh, at Otago, uh, uh, Christchurch Hospital, uh, in the med school, um, this paper here, which had been published the year before uh, in the American Journal of Epidemiology. And I took the methodology from that, and it made its way into my honours thesis. Um, my honours thesis went quite well. Um, I passed my exams, and I passed my honours thesis, and I graduated um, there with my parents at the graduation uh, in 1997 at Canterbury. Um, that paper, though, oh, here's John at his retirement, uh, wearing his um, twirly propeller beanie hat that we gave him um, when he retired at Canterbury. Um, we'll hear a little bit more about that later. Um, that paper actually utilised the, uh, the methodology that John had taught us, the Gibbs sampler methodology, um, to build a model that I will not be going through. Um, Sally was looking worried. Uh, <laughs> which would build a, model, uh, build a model based on distributions that would explain the uncertainty in two diagnostic tests. So there were two diagnostic tests um, that would test for the presence of a parasitic infection. Uh, it would say positive or negative. Uh, and neither of them was a gold standard. Each of them would miss some things. Uh, and so this was a mechanism for um, understanding the performance of those two tests and combining all the information and getting an estimate of the disease prevalence. What I was able to do uh, was to take that methodology, uh, re reproduce it on, the, on my computer in the, in the lab, uh, and reproduce the results so I knew that what I was doing was actually right, because uh, it agreed with what done, they'd done, and then extend that so that it was able to cope with our three-level system, our um, none, questionable, and, uh, and definite from, coming from that, um, that EEG reading machine, so that we could then put the EEG data in there and the expert data and, uh, and use this methodology to understand the performance. Um, which wasn't a bad effort for a fourth year student. And um, when I handed in my thesis, uh, it was marked and everything, and then I can remember Murray uh, coming to me in the, in the hallway one day at the, at the stats department and saying, that, that, um, that thesis you wrote, that was, um, that was quite good. I said, oh, thanks, Murray, that's really nice of you. Uh, and he said, um, you might want to think about doing a PhD. I said, oh, oh, really? And then he said, you might want to think about doing it overseas. <laughs> And uh, so I didn't really think too much about it, but I, I, I mulled it over. Um, and then through, a, through an interesting chain of events, um, I actually headed off to Purdue University. I didn't go alone. Uh, I'd met Mel um, by this time, and we'd gotten married. Uh, and it turned out that Mel was actually very clever, uh, and Mel was also going to do a PhD. Um, so it worked out quite well. We both headed to Purdue uh, to do a PhD. She did not do a PhD in statistics. She did a PhD in neurobiology, um, and the building for that is slightly off screen. Um, what you're looking at is part of the Purdue campus, uh, and uh, this part here is where the stats department was based uh, when I was there. So I actually had an office up here on the, the 10th floor of the, uh, the big Maths and Stats building. Now, when I arrived, uh, it was a time of change. Mary Ellen Bock had just taken over as the, um, as the head of department of statistics there, and that was after Professor Shanti Gupta had stepped down after a tenure of 27 years as head of department. So Sally, your three-year term as head of biochem is probably not looking too shabby right now. Uh, and Professor Gupta uh, stayed on, uh, he taught me while, uh, while I was there, um, and also at that time, uh, there were some new faculty arriving. Uh, Rebecca Dorge had, in, uh, had arrived in uh, 1995, and Rebecca became my PhD uh, advisor once I uh, qualified to do a PhD. Uh, and Bruce Craig had also arrived not long after. Uh, and so they were both uh, young and keen statistical faculty. And then this character over in the corner, John Dealey, had, uh, had retired from Canterbury at age 65 and immediately taken up a lecturing position at Purdue, uh, which was his alma mater. He'd actually done his PhD with Professor Gupta about 30 years earlier. Uh, and so John was lecturing there to first year stat students when I arrived uh, to start my PhD in 1997. And he did that for many, many years afterwards. 
Everything started off well. Um, I started off actually as a research assistant uh, working with Bruce. And what we actually were working, one of the things we were working on was actually extending the model that I developed at, uh, at, um, the, in my project at Christchurch Hospital uh, and using it or using um, the dependencies between tests to um, get a better estimate of prevalence. So we, we changed the model so we actually estimate uh, how strong a dependence there was between the tests. Uh, like if one test says positive, the other one's more likely to say positive, that sort of thing. And we got a really nice publication out of that. Uh, actually, it took a long time to happen. Uh, Instances in medicine it was a very, um, very satisfying one. It was a very complex mathematical one, which again, I'm not going to explain. Um, and so at that point, the trajectory was, was pretty standard. Lots of statistics work uh, going on, lots of complex mathematics. And then suddenly, I, I got a little bit blindsided, um, along came something called genomics. And um, it came along, at least for me, in the form of what's called, what are called gene expression microarrays. And this was a, a really exciting and, uh, and the groundbreaking technology that let us measure the activity levels of every gene uh, in the genome uh, in a single experiment. Uh, and so what, what that means is I could take a sample, well, I couldn't because I'm a statistician, um, someone could take a sample, uh, say of a leaf, uh, and they could do some laboratory magic, put that magic material onto a microarray, and what we could find out was how much activity, how much was each gene um, turned on um, within that uh, plant sample in, a, in this particular situation. Uh, and so that would allow us to compare different situations um, across um, say different plants exposed to different treatments. How it worked um, was by capturing um, what's called messenger RNA. So when a cell needs to make a protein, uh, what it does is it says, oh, I have instructions for that somewhere. Let me have a look. Uh, the instructions are stored in the DNA within the cell nucleus. Uh, it makes a copy of those instructions in the messenger RNA, sends it outside the nucleus to what Warren Tate has told me is the most important component of the cell, the ribosome. And uh, there it is translated into protein. So what, uh, what microarrays did is they captured that intermediate product. They captured that messenger RNA, uh, and that was uh, fixed to, um, to these, uh, these arrays. And the readout that you got would tell you what the activity levels were for every single gene um, within that sample. And what that meant was there were a lot of numbers. Right? So all of these little colored dots were turned into numbers, and we had to figure out what to do with them. The, the way in which I encountered this was through uh, Rebecca uh, calling me into her office one day, and she actually had a paper copy of Science Magazine, and she spread it out on her desk, and she said, look at this. And what I was looking at was I was looking at that picture. I was looking at the entire genome of yeast um, in a gene expression experiment. So um, the gene activity of every single gene in the yeast genome over a period of 11 hours for a particular developmental cycle in yeast. Uh, and what we're looking at here is um, each tiny little, little thin line there represents one gene. And in green, we're looking at genes whose activity decreased over time. And in red, we're looking at genes whose activity increased over time. And this was incredible because you'd never been able to see a readout like this before on a whole genome scale. The way in which these things are grouped, uh, in terms of all the green ones being together and all the red ones being together, statistical methodology was used to do that. Um, there was a, a couple of graduate students ahead of me who were working on that sort of thing. What we were more interested in working on um, at the time um, was thinking about how you could define, how you could design efficient microarray experiments. These things were quite expensive. So what was the most efficient way to design these things, and how do we analyze that data once we've done it? Um, Bruce Craig, in particular, was very interested in the design um, aspects of microarray experiments. So I embarked on a PhD. We did a lot of work uh, in terms of developing statistical methodologies for analyzing these, um, these types of experiments. And my PhD was funded by a, um, a National Science Foundation uh, plant genomics grant, so a very large infrastructure grant, or a research grant um, in plant genomics. And two of the PIs on that, one of them was uh, Rebecca George, my PhD supervisor, um, and another one was Rob Martinson from Crowd Spring Harbor. Uh, and so there's a, um, a picture of Rob there in his element in the field, um, pictured with Barbara McClintock, who was his mentor at uh, Cold Spring Harbor. Barbara McClintock got the, um, got the Nobel Prize for her discovery of uh, transposable elements, uh, also known as jumping genes, so genes which are able to excise themselves um, from the DNA of their genome um, and randomly reinsert themselves somewhere else in the genome. And what Rob's experiment uh, was doing, the, the, the experiment that generated the data we were looking at, um, was actually looking at uh, these transposable elements, these jumping genes, uh, in Arabidopsis. And so uh, Rob had a um, 
uh, a, a, what we call a wild type Arabidopsis strain uh, and a mutant. And this mutant had a particular characteristic and it was deficient in a gene that enabled what's called DNA methylation. And we're not going to get too much into uh, the, the, um, the how all that works, um, but very, very briefly, um, what Rob showed was that uh, in, the, uh, in the wild type Arabidopsis, uh, you saw um, standard levels or high levels of methylation, uh, so particular changes to the DNA uh, that would do things I'm not going to tell you about. Um, but in the mutant variety, you saw that methylation removed. Okay, so a removal of that methylation, a removal of these changes to the DNA. And what resulted from that uh, was increased activity of uh, genes in that region where the, where the methylation had been uh, removed. And you can see here the wild type uh, is not really exhibiting much activity, a lot more happening in the, in the decreased DNA methylation mutant. And those genes were those, um, were those jumping genes, those transposable elements. And so what Rob was really doing was um, helping us understand the relationship between uh, what's called heterochromatin, uh, so very tightly wound and controlled chromatin, the or tightly controlled DNA, um, the relationship with that, um, methylation and transposable elements in the genome, and some things that I'm not showing you behind the grade out but there. Um, this was an amazing paper. It's incredibly well cited. Um, where you will find my contribution is the supplementary information, which is all the boring bits um, of how the analysis was done under the hood. Uh, and so this, we were applying linear models approach that we developed, um, removing experimental artifacts, doing normalization, estimating the genetic effects, and doing all the things that we, we think of as really standard now, like hypothesis testing and multiple comparisons corrections. Um, this was all brand new stuff at the time. Uh, and so that was the, the, what was going on uh, in my PhD thesis, um, which um, ended um, rather well. Um, I paid, they had an examination. There's me at my actual thesis defense in 2002 with slides projected from an overhead projector. Um, Mel and I graduated in the same ceremony uh, very soon after that. Um, our families came to visit us uh, in the US, and so uh, families there, um, you see John and his wife Anne in the background there, and Rob Martinson and Rebecca um, there, all of us very happy to be graduated and celebrating uh, basically a wonderful five years there. And then we both got jobs at the University of Auckland, and uh, there I am in my first day on the job in the Department of Statistics in my flash new office with my flash computers, uh, feeling very much like a grown up with a real job. And it was a really exciting time at the University of Auckland. Uh, so um, Alan Rodrigo was uh, in the process, I think, of being made Professor of Bioinformatics, and he was setting up the, the Bioinformatics Institute there. Uh, and he was also setting up the bioinformatics teaching program. And so a big part of what I was doing was helping Alan set that up and, uh, and, and put some of the graduate courses in place there. I met this guy called Chris. <laughs> so Chris Print, many of you will know, Chris arrived at Auckland in, uh, I think it was 2004, and I was just blown away by what he'd done. He'd been doing some amazing work in terms of um, reconstructing gene regulatory networks from microarray data, and we became pretty much instant friends and collaborators at that point. Uh, he'd just done some, some wonderful stuff. And at the time I was working on, um, on really ex just extending the work I'd done in that microarray space and starting to work with researchers in New Zealand who are using microarrays. And then I got a phone call. I got a phone call from, uh, from Robin North, uh, who uh, was an obstetrician and gynecologist at, um, at, at Auckland Hospital and also a clinical researcher um, at the University of Auckland. And with Professor Leslie McCowan, she was putting together uh, what was called the SCOPE study. And SCOPE was screening for pregnancy endpoints. And what that study was all about was uh, looking at three uh, very, um, very uh, harmful conditions in uh, pregnancy, preeclampsia, spontaneous preterm birth, and uh, babies that are small for gestational age. And what they wanted to do was be able to identify risk factors for first time mothers um, so that we could figure out which women were at high risk of developing these conditions. Um, so the, the, um, the issue is that particularly for preeclampsia, the best predictor of preeclampsia in pregnancy is whether you had preeclampsia in your previous pregnancy, um, which is not a particularly good predictor for a first time mother. So we were looking at other clinical measurements that were taken to see if we could come up with a predictive model so that we could identify these high risk uh, women. Um, I want to highlight here, this was an absolutely landmark international study. It was led from New Zealand um, by Les and Robin. Uh, Alan Rodrigo became involved um, once it got underway, um, but eventually it included uh, five sites internationally and recruited over 5,500 women uh, and their babies uh, as part of the study. 
There's a huge number of publications that came out of it, over 100 out of the entire scope, um, scope study. Um, these are some of the ones that I was involved in. The big one for us was really that publication in BMJ, the British Medical Journal, um, which was looking at developing a predictive model for preeclampsia. And um, there was a huge amount of work that went into this. Um, Robert and I spent a ridiculous amount of time on this. Um, and what we were able to do is really say, this is as good as you can do. We could come up with this stratification system that would stratify women into low or high risk groups. Um, you could move between low and high risk depending on the results of um, some blood tests, sorry, not some blood tests, sorry, some blood pressure measurements um, or interuterine Dopplers um, during your pregnancy. Um, but it would allow the women that were in that high risk, high risk group to have more intensive monitoring during their pregnancy so that if there was any, um, any signs detected of anything adverse, like uh, maybe um, starting to develop preeclampsia, um, then it was much easier to do a pick up early and do a clinical intervention if needed. Um, so this was a, um, a really big paper that came out of Scope and it's, um, it's had a pretty big impact in clinical practice as well. But there was some stuff going on at the other end of the country as well. So around that time, uh, I met Tony Reeve. And what Tony had been doing uh, was working with a surgeon called Professor John McCall, um, who many of you will know, uh, and another guy called Perry Guilford. Uh, and what they'd done, Perry was the chief scientific officer at Pacific Edge Biotech back then. Uh, what they'd been doing on uh, Tony's very large HRC program grant was using microarrays to profile uh, colorectal cancers. And so just like we'd done uh, in my PhD with Rob, where Rob was looking at uh, gene activity in plants, Tony and Parry and John uh, and their team were looking at gene activity in tumors after the tumor had been uh, removed by surgery uh, when people were diagnosed with cancer. So there were two cohorts available. There were um, 149 tumors from New Zealand, most of them from uh, Dunedin Hospital, uh, and 55 uh, from a collaboration with, uh, with German collaborators. And so what we did was we used the, uh, the gene expression information, that gene information, gene activity information, to build a predictor, just like we'd done in the scope study, um, but instead of using clinical information that we collected from the women, now we're using uh, gene activity information that has been assayed from these tumors. And uh, what we did was we built a predictor in the New Zealand data, and then we predicted in the German data, based on that model, um, what we thought would happen to those patients. All these patients had been followed for five years, um, and we did the reverse thing. We built a, a model in the German data, and we predicted into the New Zealand data to see how they do. And what you can see here is what are called survival curves. Uh, what we're looking at is time uh, after surgery here, so you can see 60 months, five years out here. And up here is our um, group that we predicted to be good prognosis, so we predicted that the cancer wouldn't come back. And uh, what you can see is that over time, they started out, all of them were disease free, and then over time, um, someone would have a relapse, uh, so this line would drop a little bit. And so by the end of the five years, and those that we predicted would have a good prognosis, roughly 70% or so of them did. Whereas in the ones we predicted would have a bad prognosis, only about 40% of them were disease free. So a lot more of those had experienced relapse. So the amazing thing there is that you can remove a tumor perform microanalysis, look at the gene activity, and make a prediction about what's gonna to happen to that patient years in the future in terms of their disease coming back, um, which was the first time I'd ever been involved in something like this and was a real, uh, real eye-opener for me. And I'm gonna jump forward very quickly um, just to talk about that, uh, that Dunedin colorectal cohort. So that co cohort still exists today. Um, Roz is here. <laughs> um, Roz has been involved in a lot of the, the or a lot of Roz's research has involved the, um, the colorectal cohort. Um, Roz and I have had a 35 year collaboration. Uh, probably some of you are doing some math going that doesn't work. Um, Roz um, went to school with my sister, so we all grew up in Nelson together, um, and it was really exciting when Roz um, came back here to work at Otago, first in Tony Reeves' lab, actually, um, in biochemistry, um, and then very soon after that um, into a lecturing position uh, in microbiology and immunology. Uh, so Roz has been a, a, an amazing adopter of um, new technology, uh, and I've been lucky enough to be involved in some of that, but Roz has also been a real champion for that Dunedin colorectal cohort, and has uh, helped uh, establish a governance group around that, uh, and so I've got some of the individuals in that governance group there, uh, because it's an incredible uh, incredible research resources. There's over a thousand uh, patients uh, with many, many years of clinical follow-up available. So um, this has been an, an absolute, um, an absolute huge asset uh, in the research we've done. So around this time, uh, we've been thinking about prediction. Um, and we started changing our thinking a little bit. I also changed jobs. Uh, so uh, I've been working at the University of Auckland, but I've been doing so much work um, with Tony and Parry down here uh, that 
through mechanisms we won't even discuss, um, Tony was somehow able to engineer a, a shift to the Department of Biochemistry. And at this point, if Tony were here, he's traveling overseas, so he's not here, I would thank Tony very much for all his work there, um, but also um, John Cutfield, who was head of department at the time, uh, Warren Tate, who was a huge supporter of the move, uh, and also Linda Holloway, who was the, the Pro Vice Chancellor, uh, and helped, uh, helped facilitate this. So in Dunedin, focusing on this stuff, starting to look at um, what's actually going on in terms of biology. So not just can we use gene activity to predict things, but can we actually understand the biology that's going on? And we started looking at proliferation, so how fast cells are growing um, within the tumors, immune response, so um, how well the patient's immune system is actually doing at attacking the tumor, um, and also chromosomal instability, so how, um, how disrupted the, um, the chromosomes of the tumors are in terms of um, amplifications and deletions of their DNA. The whole field was doing this. Right, so this was a, an international move, and everyone was starting to think more and more and more about biology. I've got a very quick example here um, of some genes that are involved in immune response. And what you can see is I'll put a blue mark up here. These are um, tumors in which um, these high levels of immune activity, which indicates that the patient's immune system is attacking the tumor. And what you can see is that in here that the, that group is doing a lot better than this other group down here, which has lower levels of immune activity in the tumor. So this is starting to show that those biological mechanisms are actually really important in terms of patient prognosis. We really wanted to keep looking at this in colorectal cancer, but there wasn't much data. And there really wasn't a lot of data available for us to do this. And so I started looking uh, in a place where there was a lot of data, which was in breast cancer. Uh, so there'd been a lot of data generated in the breast cancer field, uh, and all of it was public, well, a lot of it was publicly available. And around that time, Tony introduced me to Heather Cunliffe. Uh, and so Heather was based at um, Translational Genomics in Phoenix at the time. And um, we hit it off instantly uh, and started, so I started doing more and more work with Heather on breast cancer. And, um, we actually eventually managed to arrange that I'd come and do a sabbatical with Heather in Phoenix. At the time, I was also working with, um, with Chris on genomic data analysis in, in uh, breast cancer. Um, and all these things coming together at once, Tony also met uh, Lance Miller, uh, who was at the time based in Singapore as a genomics researcher, who was also very, very much into, uh, into um, the analysis of breast cancer data. Uh, and Lance had some really big plans in terms of putting data together. Um, Heather and I also had really big plans. They involved forks. Do you remember, Heather, what the rest of that involved? <laughs> um, so that's us on sabbatical in Phoenix with forks. Lance, however, was not distracted by forks. And um, so what Lance wanted to do, Lance had actually been involved in a lot of the really big breast cancer studies that had been undertaken. And so what Lance wanted to do was assemble all of that data into one big set. And that was uh, no easy thing to do. There was a lot of standardization and normalization and messing around to do that. Uh, and that became my job. Uh, and so that's what I spent an awful lot of time doing. Um, but once that was done, it enabled us to start asking really complex questions about the molecular biology of the tumors um, and how they related to the characteristics of those tumors and things like patient prognosis and how the patients were responding to treatment. What you're looking at here is um, a collection of genes that are involved in proliferation, so determining how fast cells within the tumor grow. Um, and these ones here, these red ones, uh, are an indication of tumors in which those genes are really active. Um, so what that would suggest is that those genes are probably highly proliferative, they're growing quite fast. And along the top, I've got something called a metagene, uh, which is really a summary of what's going on in here. Uh, and you see I've ordered it from, from low up to high, and this would indicate those low proliferation tumors, slow growing tumors, and fast growing tumors at this end. When you take that information, turn it into numbers, um, you can plot it against tumor grade. You can see that the low grade tumors tend to have low proliferation scores. Uh, the high grade tumors tend to have high proliferation scores. This makes sense because tumor grade um, encompasses pr proliferation as part of the measure of determining grade. Um, it also makes sense across the different subtypes of breast cancer, different proliferation rates for the more and less progress uh, aggressive um, subtypes of breast cancer. So this was all very promising. Uh, we were able to ask lots of questions about lots of different biological processes um, using those samples. And we did. Uh, and so there were lots of papers um, which used that large data set uh, as the basis of the work they were doing. Um, one of them was uh, a collaboration uh, between Otago and Auckland, so Anthony Braithwaite uh, and Chris Print uh, used this, uh, this big cohort as a discovery cohort to identify the gene YB1 uh, as a key driver of uh, tumor cell growth. Uh, and then there's some really cool experiments in the lab uh, to better understand that and verify what they'd found. 
Uh, fantastic smiling picture of Chris there. Um, a slightly less well-known uh, picture of Chris as he always travels by limousine uh, as a bioinformatics rock star. Uh, and if I have time later on uh, after this, I'll tell you how we accidentally got into a limousine together in, uh, in Phoenix. <laughs> no, it's actually not as exciting as it sounds. Um, Lance was also using this as well. So um, Lance had a fantastic series of papers um, that I was involved in. Uh, where Lance was looking at the interaction between proliferation, so the speed at which tumors are growing, uh, and the patient's immune response. What Lance was able to show, um, he was able to split tumors into low proliferation groups, so we've got genes down here, and we've got, um, we've got tumors across, across here. Uh, slow growing tumors, medium growing tumors, and fast growing tumors. And then he was also stratifying by immune response, so low, medium, and high immune response for each of these groups. And what Lance was able to show was that the level of immune response actually didn't make a difference for patient prognosis, except in the situation when you had these very aggressive, rapidly growing tumors. So you can see the survival curves really starting to separate out for the strong immune response, moderate immune response, and poor immune response there. Uh, and so that was a really, uh, a really intriguing finding, and that's one that Lance has continued to follow um, for a number of years after that. So those are the sorts of things you can do um, with those. Um, I'm really glad Helen mentioned uh, NZGL. Um, I needed a slide on it so I could use this photo. Um, so <laughs> so, totally, uh, so um, Helen's already covered this. Um, Tony led this bid to create a national uh, genomics research infrastructure. Um, at some point, someone thought it was a fantastic idea to do a Fleetwood Mac-like photo shoot. Um, so there's Tony, Rachel Elliott, I can see in the audience laughing there, uh, myself and Tony Merriman. Unfortunately, it was shot in November, um, hence the, uh, the facial hair. Um, but this was a big deal. This was um, a lot of funding um, announced. It was a, a major multi-institutional initiative. Uh, it was my first foray into uh, national uh, infrastructure of any kind, uh, and it really cemented Otago as a leader in the genomic space. So this was a, um, a, it was a huge piece of work uh, that we did, uh, and it was really key for driving some of the research that came after that, um, that utilized these technologies we were able to bring in. Um, there have been a lot of other things that have come up along the way. Um, uh, Lisa alluded to the fact that I've worked on a lot of, a lot of different organisms, uh, and I have. Um, some of you will perhaps recognize some of your favorites out there. I don't have time to talk about all those exciting things that, um, that I've been involved in um, with some wonderful researchers here, but I will dwell just briefly on this one, um, which was an initiative that was led by Phil Wilcox before he saw the light and moved to Dunedin. Um, and I know he's up there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, Phil led a, a fantastic program um, across multiple institutions um, called the Virtual Institute for Statistical Genetics. And at Otago, uh, it was myself and Tony Merriman um, that was involved. And um, this uh, spawned some um, amazing research by um, some great graduate students. So um, uh, Huang, James, and Murray um, did some incredible work and in methods for um, looking at gene copy number changes um, in, in DNA. Um, James applied that methodology uh, to both gout and apples. His master's thesis is actually titled um, Gene Copy Number in Gout and Apples. Um, so the apple work was done with, uh, in collaboration with David Charnier at uh, Plant and Food Research. Uh, and then Murray did some fantastic work on genetic uh, selection in Pacific populations. Um, and those guys have used those publications um, really as a springboard to go on do some great, uh, great stuff in their careers. Right, but back to cancer. So uh, 2009, uh, we visited Singapore, met some wonderful people. Um, there was some misbehaving at dinner. Um, what you're looking at is one of the courses, and that course was chicken uh, baked in clay. And what you did, the instructions were, take the hammer, gently tap the clay um, to break apart, and then the chicken will be revealed. Whatever you do, don't smash the chicken, for then the clay will become embedded in the chicken and it will become very hard to eat. Parry is illustrating that uh, in his stance. <laughs> Luckily, there were a number of other courses available so we didn't go hungry. Um, I did have some of the clay embedded chicken, it was not good. Um, the people we met were Nancy Jenkins and Neil Copeland uh, and their senior postdocs, Karen and Michael Mann, all of whom have become great friends and collaborators over the years. And what they had done over many years is develop a system, uh, an experimental system called Sleeping Beauty Insertional Mutagenesis uh, in mouse for studying cancer. I will not go through this, um, but basically what uh, Neil and Nancy had done was they'd taken those jumping genes that I talked about earlier uh, in the work with Rob, they'd taken those jumping genes and they'd engineered one of them um, to be uh, very, very specific in what it did. They created a system where they could actually turn that jumping gene on at a particular time in a particular tissue in mouse. And what it would do, there were many, many copies of this, it would start jumping around in the genome. And if it hit a gene, 
uh, that was involved in uh, preventing cancer and, and messed up the, the, the function of that gene, or if I had a gene that might, um, might promote cancer and it, it started, you know, really increased the activity of that gene, what would happen? Would a tumor, a tumor would, uh, would form. And if you took the tumors that form uh, and you figured out where those transposons had inserted themselves and what genes they'd hit, um, you could start to understand what genes are involved in the development and growth of cancers. These are the genes that are actually causing cancer. Um, and so they had developed the system, everything was working. What they needed to do was figure out how that related to human cancer. And so that was where they didn't have as much expertise. And so that was the challenge for me, was um, I taking the work they'd done and identifying the relevance in, uh, in human cancer. And so it called for another sabbatical, not in Singapore, because by that time, Neil and Nancy had gotten jobs in Houston. And so they were based at Houston Methodist Research Institute. And, and so off we went uh, to Houston. Um, we went to NASA. There's a picture of us at NASA. And as I inserted this into my slides the other day, I noticed there was this guy over here. And it's actually Chris Print. Um, and so Chris had come to visit. Uh, we went to NASA with Chris. And Chris was um, waiting very patiently for us to have a family photo in front of the rocket, um, not knowing that he was, of course, in the photo. Um, that's uh, me trying to send one of my kids into space. It didn't, it didn't work, um, but it was great fun. Um, and then for the New Zealand-based researchers, this is lab lunch at Ugo's restaurant in Houston. Um, not remarkable, it is a remarkable restaurant, it's fantastic. What is remarkable that aside from um, myself, Mal, Neil, and Nancy, almost every person around that table is a postdoctoral researcher. They had 15 postdocs in their research group. When you do the math on that, you can tell that they were a very, very well-funded operation. So um, what that well-funded operation had been doing was lots and lots of research. So over a number of years, Chris uh, and I, along with Michael uh, and Neil and Nancy and Karen, um, had been working across a number of tumors, uh, tumor types. Um, this one uh, in, in melanoma that Michael had led um, was um, one where they managed to identify um, a collection, a core collection of genes that were really driving um, the development of melanoma. And what we were able to do was um, show that those, um, sort of those genes were definitely relevant in, in human cancer, and then there was a whole lot of other uh, experimental work that was also done uh, to validate that these things were really um, true um, melanoma drivers. Um, so that was a, that was a, a, a very, very long um, multi-year piece of work um, that was done. And then that system was extended, so Karen had a fantastic publication extending that um, extending that system into single cell analysis, so actually being able to do the transposon analysis in individual cells, um, which at the time was pretty amazing. Um, and it also brought in uh, some familiar faces. Um, it brought in uh, Les and Lux, who did some, uh, did some genomics work in the genomics facility for this project. So we were able to send some samples back to New Zealand, have them do the work, send the data back over, um, and then incorporate that into the analysis. So that was a fantastic way to connect um, kind of both of our worlds together. Um, and it wasn't the only time. So um, Anita and I supervised uh, Aziz uh, in his PhD. Uh, he completed his PhD, and uh, he managed to actually get a postdoctoral position with Karen and Michael, who at that point had, um, had set up new labs in, uh, in Tampa at Moffat Cancer Center. Uh, and so Aziz was able to go over, um, use some of the data they generated from, uh, from that uh, mutagenesis model, uh, this time in squamous cell carcinoma, uh, had a fantastic publication in PLOS Genetics, and has recently uh, taken a position in Singapore now. Um, so great opportunity for an Otago graduate to go over to a really big, uh, big lab in the US and do some, uh, do some amazing research. Uh, and so that kind of takes me on to capability building, um, which um, for those of you who know me, um, this has been a big part of what I've been doing recently at Otago. Um, so in 2015, my PhD student asked for money to go and camp at the University of Melbourne. Um, so that was Tom Kelly. Uh, and what Tom Kelly was talking about was something called Research Bazaar. And Research Bazaar was something that was running at the University of Melbourne, and it was designed to teach digital skills, so computer programming and analysis um, and computation, um, to uh, early career researchers and graduate students. And it was kind of backed or, or, or built on uh, something called software carpentry, carpentry training. Uh, and so they ran um, a program of what was called instructor training, where they would teach people how to teach all these concepts. Uh, and I went along to that. I didn't do the camping. Um, and we brought that back. And uh, we brought that back to New Zealand and have started growing this community of people who can deliver these, uh, these types of training um, around the country. Uh, and so it was kind of underpinned by this thing called the Software Carpentry Foundation. Um, this guy here is sitting up there in the audience somewhere. He promised he'd be making faces at me. There he is. Um, Jonah Duckles liked what we were doing so much, he moved his entire family to Dunedin um, to see what we were up to. Um, he's been fantastic to work with this, uh, work with on this. 
It's also been strongly supported by um, the New Zealand eScience infrastructure, uh, and Nick Jones there as the director um, has really been a good supporter of us running these training workshops, which many of you, many of you will have been to, and many of your graduate students will have been to, to learn some of these computational tools um, that have been so valuable to my research. Um, it was also strongly supported um, by Tony's and my research group. So um, some pictures up there, um, a few extras on the end, um, but uh, Tony's group in particular really took to this and really saw the value of um, of these types of of analytic abilities as uh, really part of modern genomics. So that data analysis that was such a key part of the, the work we're doing. Um, this has fed into the work we're doing in Genomics Aotearoa. So uh, Genomics Aotearoa, another um, major multi-institutional uh, research initiative uh, and infrastructure uh, led by Peter Dearden here at Otago. Uh, and my role in that is to oversee the bioinformatics component. And a big part of that is capability building. Uh, so. Um, our training team, so particularly Ngoni, uh, who's just left us to pursue a clinical genomics opportunity in, uh, in the US, uh, and also Dini from, from Nessie, and more recently, now Tyler, who we've just hired um, as our training coordinator, they have been running these amazing workshops. So um, over a 1,000 attendees over a three-year period, um, 51 workshops, uh, and all of these people coming to learn all of these different computational and bioinformatics techniques. Um, another key part of what Genomics Aotearoa is doing, at least the part that I'm involved in, um, is building up a genomic data repository uh, for the data that we generate from our indigenous species. So those Taonga species uh, that are being studied in partnership with Māori, um, we need a place to put the data that's generated in New Zealand uh, so that we can preserve um, the kaitiakitanga that's associated um, with, those, with those data. Um, it also allows us to facilitate the management and sharing um, of that data uh, in a way that upholds the principles of Māori data sovereignty. Um, this has been a really important initiative within GA, uh, and although the team has been uh, fantastic and has done a wonderful job, um, I'd really like to single out Ben here, uh, Ben Tiaika, um, as having developed the, the cultural protocols that underpin all of the access requests uh, and, the, and the data submission um, that goes on. Um, so that's been a, a fantastic win there. I'm getting close to the end. Probably everyone's getting tired and thirsty. Um, I'd really also like to highlight some work I've been doing uh, more recently with, um, with the genomics team uh, at ESR. So uh, Donya and Yoop and Miles, who has just left um, to join another company, um, have been great collaborators and have given us the opportunity to have uh, co-supervised PhD students based at ESR, so working in a, in a Crown, Research, uh, um, in, in, uh, Crown <laughs> Research Institute environment. Um, Miles is pictured there with some cool toys. Um, those cool toys have certainly uh, sort of bled over into the work that we're doing uh, in the lab. Um, we've got some pictures of the cool toys there, and um, we have a picture of Happy Parry and Sad Jordan. Um, so what Happy Parry and Sad Jordan are through, here is on my desk uh, in my office, we've got a mini DNA sequencer, we've got a touch screen, and we've got a tiny computer that runs the whole thing. Um, Happy Perry and Sir Jordan are trying to look at the output from one of those DNA sequences on their phone. Um, the big screen TV in Perry's office is set up, it's receiving the signal. Perry's phone is receiving the signal from the sequencer. Unfortunately, Jordan's was not. But we managed to fix it, and I think Sir Jordan became Happy Jordan. Um, so that portable te te technology has opened a lot of doors um, in terms of um, the ability to, to sequence anything, anytime, anywhere. Um, these two guys um, have got some, some funding uh, to investigate some very, very clever ways of doing that sequencing uh, in something called circulating tumor DNA analysis. So looking at clever ways of doing that. Um, and this is, um, this is really looking at DNA in the bloodstream that has come from tumors and, and cancer patients. And so this can be used for early detection of cancer and it can also be used for monitoring cancer patients um, while they're undergoing treatment to see um, what's going on with the tumor, whether the tumors come back um, or whether the tumor is still um, in remission. Um, we've got um, work going on in terms of single cell sequencing. So again, being able to look at what's going on at a genomic level inside single cells. Um, and again, that um, portable genomics is a, is a key part of um, being able to get out into the community and demonstrate these things, but also potentially do that genomic work um, in different places. And there's too many photos there to put names on, um, but this is all the gang that are involved in um, a lot of these projects, um, which are being led by, um, by Perry Guilford in the lab. So, I have no idea how much time I took to get here, um, but it's time to say some thank yous. Um, I'd like to thank my family. Uh, so here are um, Liam and Kieran. Uh, a few years ago now, they're a bit bigger than this now, they can probably actually grow their own moustaches now. Um, so I'd like to thank you guys. Um, 
My son's shaking his head at me at the moment. <laughs> I'd like to thank you guys for, for being wonderful and for being so much fun over the years, and I'm sure we're going to have a lot of fun uh, going forward. Um, Mel, I would like to thank you for all your support over the years. You've been wonderful. Mum and Suze, thanks for coming down. It's great to see you. You've been very supportive. Bob and Jay, fantastic to be here. Um, I've had really a, a great experience. My family have had a really supportive family, um, and it's fantastic that they're able to be here to, uh, to share this tonight. These guys I need to thank. These guys weren't able to be here tonight, um, but uh, Tony in particular was instrumental uh, in getting me uh, excited about cancer genomics and in getting me um, to Otago. Uh, and Perry has been uh, absolutely inspirational and they've both been wonderful friends and colleagues and mentors over many years. Um, but as you saw, um, there have been a huge number of wonderful people um, that I've been lucky enough to interact with. Uh, and so that has made this an incredibly enjoyable journey um, to get to this point. Um, students, there's lots of them sitting over there. Um, students have made this job um, really what it is. It's fantastic to work with um, such bright uh, and dedicated young people uh, who are so uh, dedicated, I said dedicated already, um, so intent on, uh, on what they're doing. Uh, and um, we've had an amazing crop over the years. Um, I hope I haven't missed anyone out there. Um, and. Um, in addition, um, many of you have sent those students um, my way. Um, most of my students are co-supervised um, and doing really uh, interesting and amazing projects. Um, so thank you all for all of the, um, all of the interactions we've had over the years. Um, there are many, many, many collaborative projects I've been involved in, and I haven't been able to talk about probably even half of them. Um, and the last thing I'd say is I'd like to thank the Department of Biochemistry. Um, the Department of Biochemistry, uh, even though I made fun of them right at the start, um, is really an amazing place to work. Um, it's a fantastic team of people. Um, the Cancer Genetics Lab is great to work in. The whole Cancer Genetics Lab is um, just amazing. But then the whole biochemistry department, the, the admin staff, the IT team, um, the teaching fellows um, have really made it an incredibly enjoyable place to be. So I'm really glad I made the decision to, uh, to, to leave Auckland uh, and come down here to Dunedin and, uh, and become part of such a wonderful department. So um, thank you all for your attention. Um, hopefully you have some idea of uh, how a statistician ended up in the middle somewhere in there um, of, of a very well-masked uh, biochemistry department. <laughs> thank you all very much. Tēnā koutou katoa. He a pai ki te ki te ki a koutou. Ko Sally McCormick toko ingoa. So thank you all for coming along tonight. Uh, it's great that you came along to celebrate um, Mick's promotion. He's got so, quite the support crew here with his family and friends and a number of colleagues uh, across the university. Uh, what to say about Mick? <laughs> There's lots to say. There's lots to say. Um, thank you, Mick, for your awesome lecture. Uh, I think we just all enjoyed very much hearing about your, your career, um, all of your collabor collaborations, all the people you've interacted with, the fun that you've had with your colleagues uh, is clear, um, and uh, we really, really enjoyed it. So thank you very much. Um, of course, what we've seen, you, Mick has the unique skill of being able to work these large data sets and making, making sense of them. Um, and this is a school, skill that is just so important across all facets of science. Um, and I think it's fair to say from day one, Mick, you were in huge demand, um, and even more so now. Um, and, and he's been in key demand as a, as a, a key collaborator, uh, as a student supervisor, as an advisor, um, and as a leader in uh, establishing uh, a number of research entities. And of course, we've heard Tonight, the fruits of your collaborations and all of the wonderful work you've done working up uh, cancer genome uh, data sets and coming up with some really important information about cancer biology, diagnosis, um, therapies, uh, et cetera. Um, and that, that kind of stuff is so important for, for moving forward into um, the future in personalised medicine. Really important. Um, Mick has also been in huge demand as a teacher. Um, I think at last count you, you t teach in 10 papers. And right across the board, um, he has had absolutely outstanding evaluations. And the things that come through always in his evaluations are his passion, his enthusiasm, and his ability to explain very complex um, concepts. 
Uh, his passion for teaching obviously extends way beyond Otago. We've seen, you know, the data, um, the, the carpentry workshops that Mick has been uh, integral in um, establishing right up and down the country. And it's actually very comforting to know that there's a whole generation of students that now are, are going to um, be able to um, perform statistics and bioinformatics and you've, you've transferred some of your skills um, to a whole new generation of students. Uh, what to say about Mick? I mean, there's just too many qualities. I, I can't list them all, but I'll just uh, pull out a few. You're very calm, you're very logical, uh, you're inclusive, you're professional, and you're very, very collegial. And I think those qualities have seen you chairing a number of committees uh, right across the university and nationally. Um, but I thought I would just leave the last word uh, with your supervisor um, from Purdue. So she said, Mick is an extremely nice, well-grounded uh, young man, mature beyond his years. Every professor in their career should have the good fortune of having worked with such a gifted student. Mick, you are now the professor, uh, and I'm pretty sure, uh, having seen all the talented students that you have um, attracted into your lab over the years that you will indeed have the good fortune of having many gifted students working with you. Congratulations on making Professor. The department's very, very proud of you and we are absolutely extremely lucky to have you um, in our department. So well done. And I think I, there's a gift, a little gift that I need to present with you, that I present to you. There we go. It's not a thousand dollars. I think it's over to you, Neil, perhaps. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Neil Gemmel tōko ingoa. Uh, so I'm Neil Gemmel and I'm the Acting Deputy Pro Vice-Chancellor Health Sciences. And I have the easiest job of the evening, which is actually just to thank Mick again for a wonderful lecture and actually invite you to participate in uh, some light beverages to celebrate with Mick uh, his significant achievement. I just want to add, because I have collaborated with Mick, uh, what a wonderful privilege it has been to work with you over the years. Uh, you're a wonderful colleague. And one of the things that I think people don't recognise uh, is that you're such an amazing instigator of uh, new uh, initiatives. And, and I've really admired that about you over the years, and I thank you for that. Um, so please, uh, just join with me in thanking again Otago Mick uh, for his wonderful uh, oration uh, for his IPL. Thank you very much, Mick.